seconds, uh, 7 o'clock, something like that. How's everyone doing? Enjoy the pizza? All right, so my name is Ryan Boyd. I'm here with new 4 j uh, and we're also here with Kevin Madden, who is going to be speaking uh, from Tom Sawyer. And we're here to talk about graph databases uh, and how graph databases are visualized and analyzed within Tom Sawyer software. Uh, so, first of all, I want to talk, like, to set the groundwork as to what graph databases are here for. Um, I imagine most of you use relational databases, show of hands. Okay. Um, and some of you use sort of NoSQL databases like Mongo or Cassandra or something like that. Anyone? Alright. Handful. Um, so we've been taught for a long time. Um, I've been taught ever since like I took my first computer science class and even before then to use relational databases to store your data as tables with columns and rows and normalize it across multiple tables to show your relationship. And it you know, ends up looking something like this, except much more complex, right? So we have, we have tables and they relate to each other through foreign keys and then when you perform, uh, when you're trying to do queries, you do a lot of joins. Well, is it really natural to store your data like this? Is this really how your mind thinks about your data? Um, I don't think so. It's definitely not how my mind thinks about their data. My data. Um, I imagine maybe for people that have been in this business for 40, 50 years doing relational databases, maybe their mind works that way, but for most of you, it's probably not. Your mind really thinks something more like this. It thinks about nodes and relationships, or objects and relationships between those objects. And, you know, this is what you would put on a whiteboard. You would go and map out something like this, uh, this is about different organizations and the organizational structure. But this is what you're thinking about when you model your data. Um, and what we really aim to do with graph databases is kind of make the alignment better between what you think about as engineers and what the business folks uh, think about uh, when they're deciding to model their data. Because if you reduce the complexity of the friction between those two, it can make all of our lives much easier. So this is the more natural way. This is what we use uh, in graph databases. We have nodes, and then the relationships uh, between those nodes and other nodes. Uh, so it's fairly simple. It's, you know, any time you would think about a row in one of your, your main tables um, in your database, it would become a node and a node type. Uh, and then you have your relationships, which is where you would do your joins or your foreign keys in a relational database. So my goals today is, first of all, convince you that graphs are more natural. It's a more natural, intuitive way to store your data, to query your data. And then also that graphs can actually be much more performant or efficient for some types of queries, for some types of data. Uh, and I do want to preface that with, like, you know, I'm saying graphs are more natural and graphs can be more performant. Um, I don't think that you just have to use graphs for when they're more performant. You have a lot of people that just choose to use graphs in the real performant use cases, like social network analysis, like some fraud detection, like some other things where graphs are, are fairly necessary to do the analysis in real time. Um, but they can be also much more natural, and so you should consider them for those sort of use cases as well, even if, even if it's not necessarily giving you the performance benefits. Um, you know, it just gives you the peace of mind of having this natural environment. So within Neo4j, uh, we use the property graph, is what it's called. Um, and the property graph model has nodes and relationships. And so on here we have three different nodes, two people and one car. Uh, those, the names person, person, and car are considered labels in Neo4j. Um, and then in each of those nodes have properties. Uh, so those properties here are represented, the person at the top left has a name of Dan, born a particular date, and then a Twitter handle about Dan. Uh, those are all properties. Neo4j is schemaless, so that means that you can add and remove these properties on the fly. You can add and remove nodes with different labels on the fly. It's very flexible and kind of allows you to adapt to the business without having to like restructure uh, all of your table definitions as you would in a, in a relational database. Um, so you have these, these properties, and then you have the relationships. Uh, so in this case here, Dan loves Anne, 
Uh, and lucky for Dan, Anne also loves uh, Dan, uh, Neo4j does directed relationships, so every relationship that you put does have a direction. You can end up querying it in either direction. So, uh, for instance here, like, you could store Dan loves Anne and Anne loves Dan. That's kind of a more natural way to store it. The more efficient way would just be to store it in one direction. Uh, perhaps who, who asked each other out on the first date or something like that, because then you can do the query to, to figure out the symmetric relationships. Um, and on those relationships, uh, you can also have properties. So in this case here, Dan drives uh, this car, who happens to be owned by Anne, uh, and has this property, like the synth state. When did Dan start driving that car? Uh, and so each of these relationships can have properties, it's optional. Any of these properties are optional, but this is the general structure of the property graph and how data is stored in Neo4j. And where it gets a lot of the performance advantages is that the data is actually stored on disk in a very similar format. Um, we have the, the graph databases book from O'Reilly, which you can all, you can download for free as a PDF, and we'll have a couple copies here that we're going to auction off to those people who signed in. That goes into detail about the structure of how these are stored on disks, how the nodes are stored on disks, how the relationships are stored on disk. Uh, but the best way to describe it is uh, we call it index-free adjacency. What that means is as you move from a node to the next node over a relationship, it doesn't actually have to look up an index. Really it is doing pointer arithmetic, either on disk or in memory, to see where the next node is in, in the graph. Uh, this allows you to do what typically would be done as joins in a relational database as, as somewhat expensive index lookups. It allows you to do it literally with just pointer arithmetic. And so that makes traversing out a graph uh, much more efficient for some use cases. All right, so how did that happen? Microsoft error reporting. PowerPoint encountered a problem. There's a surprise. All right, so I were going to talk about my next slide as I try to open up PowerPoint again. Uh, on that slide was a picture of a gentleman named Volker from eBay. Uh, and Volker is an engineer at eBay, and they had a challenge. They, they were doing real-time delivery. Um, so basically, you could order products, and there'd be people that would go and find those products in a store, and then deliver those products to your house. And... I just hit play from start, I think. Whoops. Um, and so they would find these products, and um, they would need to figure out, as eBay, they would need to figure out how to best route these products, how, what store to pick them up from, what delivery person to have pick them up, um, and then how to get to your house to deliver those products. Um, there has to be a more efficient way. Let me go back here. Oh, I was very close to being there. Thank you but I give up. Uh, play from current slide. Um, so they would have to do these queries to figure out what delivery person to use and what product, you know, where to pick up the product and that sort of thing. And their queries were originally done in a relational database in MySQL. And uh, their longest running queries to figure out the appropriate routing algorithm actually took longer than their shortest delivery times. So they could actually go and send someone to pick up a product and deliver that product to someone else in less time than it took their routing queries to run at times, uh, which was a big problem for them. Um, so they wanted to rewrite this, and they rewrote it uh, in Neo4j. And this, this stage uh, demo here is actually him talking at our Graph Connect conference. Um, and he's talking at our Graph Connect conference, and he ordered a bottle of whiskey at the beginning of his talk. Uh, and it's a, only a 30 minute talk, and I think about halfway through or something, the bottle of whiskey was delivered to him on stage. And he's really just demonstrating that Neo4j helps him get whiskey, which I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, it depends on your taste. Um, but, uh, you know, that's, that's really what it's all about. It's about doing those quick performing queries uh, in things like this, in routing and logistics, it's very useful for him. So he said, we found Neo4j to literally be thousands of times faster than their previous MySQL solution. And then the other point here is also really important, with 10 to 100 times less code. Basically, it took less code to write uh, the application and less code to maintain. So all around, like, they ended up uh, saving a lot of engineering time as well as time for their customers. 
And while I'm talking about a GraphConnect presentation, I'll plug GraphConnect. It's our conference. It's uh, at the end of October uh, the 21st, is it? Yes. October 21st. Uh, and you all can get $100 off if you use this promo code. It's only $199, so that'll make it $99 for you. Uh, and I'll display this promo again, code again after my presentation in, in, in case you need some time to get convinced. Um, all right, Neo4j, it can be run in two different ways. It can be run in an embedded mode with a Java traversal framework. That's where the 4j comes from in its name. It originally was written as a Java application. And uh, so all applications back then you know, that were for Java had 4j in it, so log4j and that sort of thing. Um, so we originally wrote as Java. You can run an embedded mode, you can write all your Java code to, to traverse the different parts of the graph and do your query analysis. If you're a Java nut, you might want to do this. Uh, for the rest of us, uh, you can run it in this server mode uh, with a REST API and this thing called Cypher, which is our query language. So similar to SQL except optimized for graph queries. Um, so this is, is what the majority of our customers do when they're, you know, when they're first starting out at least, is they run it in the server, server mode, they query over the REST API with Cypher. Uh, this you know, is what Tom Sawyer is looking into when, when they query your data. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Cypher now and the query language. So the Cypher query language basically allows you to run queries on your graph data. So you've, you've stored your graph data, and we're going to show you how you store it here soon. Uh, but after your graph data is stored, you can run queries. And uh, these queries here are, uh, it's a very simple one here. So let's say our graph contains Stephen reports to Andrew, and we want to uh, match the, that exact relationship. Now this is a little bit cheating because we know that's in the graph and we're going to do a query that matches just this. But we're going to say match the employee labels, so the objects that are employees, uh, with the first name of Stephen. And then you can see it uh, has the relationship reports to in the directional sense to an employee whose first name is Andrew. Uh, and we actually call Cypher ASCII art for graphs. It really is kind of like that. Um, and we have a bunch of stickers that are, that are like that as well. I don't know if you brought any today. But you know, it's really just like we're matching this object with an arrow, this type of relationship, this other object. Uh, and that, you know, that arrow makes it a more intuitive way to query than, say, a bunch of subselects or unions or that sort of thing, uh, joins. Um, so anyway. That's what this query is doing. We're going to get to much more interesting queries here shortly. Uh, but first of all, the two different components of Cypher, uh, the two different main clauses here, is the match statement. The match statement basically says, here is the pattern that you're looking for in the graph. Uh, so in this case, we're looking for a user who has a skill, uh, that another, a different user also shares that same skill. And then the where statement, basically tells us where to start in the search. It grounds our graph search um, and also puts restrictions on the traversal. Uh, so in this case, we're looking where the absolute value of the difference between the skill levels is less than two. We're looking for employees who have quasi the same uh, level of skill in a particular skill. Uh, I'm going to skip over this due to time and skip right to here. Uh, we're doing some SQL queries, queries compared to Cypher. Um, and so in this, this query uses our movie data set, which is actually one of the default data sets included in Neo4j. Uh, Neo4j is a database, it's downloadable software, you might think it takes forever to get going. Uh, literally you can, can do the download and get running, depending on your network connection, in about 59 seconds. So I encourage you all to try it out. Uh, the movie data set is included. So here we can say we're selecting a director name, uh, and then how many movies that Lucy has starred in. Uh, you know, that are, that are directed by that director. And in this case, we're doing a couple different joins. We're selecting from the person table, but also joining on the person table, because we're looking at both the actor as well as the director. Um, and then looking at the actor and director mapping tables as well. Anyway, that's the SQL. This is the Cypher, uh, which to me is, is just a much more intuitive way here, because we're basically saying at the top, match a person, uh, and we're nicknaming it Lucy, that's an alias, who acts in a movie, and then a director who directs a movie. And it doesn't have to be the same movie. Um, and we're making sure that the person's name is Lucy Liu, and returning the director name uh, and, and the count of it, and ordering by the count. 
Uh, so but to me, the ASCII art form of expressing this is much more natural than a bunch of joins. So this is actually a real query from uh, a user or, or a customer. Um, it was find all direct reports from a person. And so let's say a VP, find all of their direct reports and how many people those direct reports manage up to three levels down. So this really came from a customer as this uh, SQL query. Now, I, I would argue that it's probably not the most optimized SQL query, but it is SQL that real customers write. Um, and in this case, like essentially it's a bunch of unions and things are copied and pasted a bunch of times for each level of the, the join operation. Um, and maintaining that is obviously a pain. Um, the equivalent cipher query is that at the same font text or this uh, at, at a higher font size. Um, and that's where basically saying match a manager who reports to up to three levels uh, deep, a boss, and then a report who reports up through three levels deep to a manager. Uh, and restricting it for when the boss name is, is John Doe, so the boss is our VP here. And then returning a list of each of, of the managers that report to him, uh, along with the count of reports. It's just a, a much more natural way to express it and a heck of a lot less code. All right, so I'm gonna jump quickly into my editor here. And uh, so this is Sublime, which I think will pop up here. Yes. So this is Sublime, and this is with the commodity flow data um, that we're going to be using later today, or that Tom Sawyer is going to be using. Um, and the commodity flow data basically says how commodities flow between different areas. Uh, there are multiple uh, areas per state and things like that. And it starts out as CSV data here, uh, which is typically how you import data into Neo4j. So we have a bunch of CSV files. First here we have an areas CSV file, which you can think of as like a table uh, in a relational database with each of the areas. Uh, so we can see here like in California, there's uh, metro areas as uh, San Jose, San Francisco, Oakland, San Diego, Carlsbad, San Marcos. Um, and then we have the states, which is just you know, the state abbreviations and the state names. And we have commodities, which is a list of commodities that are coded. So things like coal, uh, coal, coal, coal uh, wood products, printed products, all different sort of commodities that are traded, imported, exported between different states. And then you have flows, which basically say, uh, here's a particular area, and here's the commodity that flows through that area, and here's how much flows. And the Tom Sawyer software will make it a lot easier to visualize this here later. Um, but that's, that's kind of the basic setup, is we have a handful of CSV files. The commodity flows is broken into a bunch of CSVs, but basically it's a handful of CSVs. Um, and then we load that CSV data into Neo4j with something like this. Uh, so we're using this load CSV command. Uh, and this loads either from the local file system, as is being done here, or loads over HTTP if you want to have data that's hosted on GitHub or somewhere like that. Uh, and then we're saying load, so this is loading in the areas, and then we're creating the area node with a name specified by the, the CSV files, uh, you know, header of area, the CSV file header of state. Um, and then we are matching existing states that already exist uh, and creating the relationship between the state and the area. Uh, so the same sort of cipher code that we use for running queries is also what we use for creating these objects. Um, and there's a couple more examples here, but largely it is uh, loading the file in from CSV and then creating the nodes and potentially uh, you know, matching, matching existing objects in the graph in order to connect those nodes uh, as relationships with these create syntax commands. You don't need to memorize all that, it's obviously in a reference guide, but I just kind of wanted to show you, uh, you know, in general, how you can load data into Neo4j. So mostly it's from CSV files. Uh, this way we'll, uh, we'll load it through, you can use the, the Neo4j browser, which you'll see here with Tom Sawyer. Um, and uh, you can also use a command line tool which loads uh, more efficiently without transactions. You do like hundreds of millions of rows in, in a few seconds. Um, but uh, this is a much more easier way to express it. So with that, 
I am going to turn you back over here, or turn you over to Kevin. Um, and Kevin is going to talk about how Tom Sawyer integrates with Neo4j and does visual analysis of graphs. So, thank you. Thank you, Ryan, very much. Um, yes, just the uh, switch the screen here. does and how we interact with Neo. Um, the basic thing is what Tom Sawyer does is we do graph visualization which allows you to take the data that you put into a graph database or other relational store and get them to the web so that your users can do actionable items on top of it. So you can visualize relationships, you can uh, understand the relationships that are within those queries. Because uh, graph databases grow very rapidly, and uh, with linked data um, and the schemaless uh, data model, uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit more complex. So Tom Sawyer has a product called Perspectives, and we have a, a web application designer, and then we let you preview the web application, and then we let you deploy the web application to the web. So this allows you to connect to data sources like Neo and bring like vi uh, stunning visual displays to to your users. Um, Tom Sawyer supports uh, structured, semi-structured, and unstructured. Uh, we have what's known as a uh, model data integration, uh, a data modeling, data visualization, visualization interaction, and graph analysis. I know that's a lot. But this is what it takes to bring some of these more complex applications to the world. Uh, there's many phases to it depending on uh, what you're trying to glean from the information, uh, whether it be social network analysis, uh, cluster analysis, other types of um, graph analysis techniques that you can do. So I'll push forward. This is uh, an example of our what we call our Tom Sawyer Perspectives Designer. I'll just, uh, over here you can see the cipher, which is uh, what Ryan was just explaining before. And uh, I'll just push right into a demo. Okay. So, Tom Sawyer's Perspectives Designer allows you to, what we call, integrate data. So in this case, I have, uh, I would do new add integrator, and I want to connect to that Neo database that he just created. So we have what we call a definition. So I have a data source right here, localhost 7474. Uh, and then over here I have my little Neo4j running. So if you would download and install Neo4j, and you inserted the CSV files, just as you were showing a minute ago, it would, uh, it would show up like this. And I can click on it here, and that's the web app, the local web app that's running, that's hosting the Neo. That could be running on a remote server, or it could be running locally. Uh, it's running locally for now. Um, so, Tom Sawyer Perspectives Designer allows me to uh, create what we call bindings. Basically, we create what's known as a UI schema. Basically, we're able to look at the data that comes out of the Cypher query and turn it into something that the UI can render so that you can abstract the underlying data store, whether it be Oracle or MySQL or whether it be an XML definition or anything like that or an Excel spreadsheet, what have you. So, uh, showing before, Ryan was showing you that we had areas which have uh, a state, a name, 
uh, and other calculated columns that had information that was about commodities. When we talk about commodities, we're talking about like products, like uh, whether it be wood products moving from the northwest south, or whether it be uh, oil coming out of Texas, or whether it be uh, particular products that are region specific, like uh, manufactured parts and stuff like this. Um, so we have we are a model driven architecture, which means that changes to the model will represent themselves into the UI, and they change and they dynamically. The diagrams are dynamically generated from the model. Uh, we have a series of. Um, so we have one integrator, which defines the states, and then we have another integrator, um, test it, connect, that does the links. So here's the flow. Okay, and state. Okay. Click on area. So here's the cipher that we have. I can copy this. I'll bring it up into the web browser. Click over here. Paste it in, and I'm going to execute it. So this is how it looks in the uh, when it comes out of the query. I can you get the state of Connecticut, the, the abbreviated name, uh, some values. We'll clean the information. Um, okay, so if I can go back to my designer, that's kind of how they go. So the states they match up to columns. It's almost like an ETL process or a, a, a trend. You're creating like a transition from one model to another. Uh, and in this case, it's tabular data, but it, it is coming out of a graph database. Okay, and then so we define each value in turn. Then what I want to do is I want to create a series of views. Okay, like in in general, we have um, a, we have a tree view, we have a tree view, we have a tree view, and tree view. We have a, what we call our drawing view. If I go back to my uh, PowerPoint, I'll show you right there. Um, and the drawing view is a graph view. That's the view that allows you to see all the complex interactions between the drugs. So I'll bring up the web app really quick. I have, uh, you see this little Java guy here? This is uh, an embedded Tom, this is a local Tomcat server which is hosting the web app that we built. Okay? So I click on here. And I'll log into my web app, and you'll see the commodities here. Okay, there's the areas that Brian was showing earlier, states that connect the states, and over here you see the commodities that were in that list. So now what we're going to do is we have what we call a tree control, which allows us to modify the values that we send to Cypher, and that we can get different actionable results. So say I'm uh, an auto executive, and I want to see how commodities are moving throughout the United States because I want to study the auto industry. So I know that there's a few states in here that I'm interested in. So I can go down here and say, oh, Detroit, Michigan, I want to know about that. Uh, oh, Kentucky's got the Toyota plant, I want to know that. And then, okay, well, I want to see, uh, let's see, the state of Texas has a lot of, they build a lot of suburbans there. So I can go down here and I can select what parts that I want to, um, what commodities I'm interested in studying. So I want to study precision instruments, I want to see motorized vehicles, and I want to understand, say, plastics and rubber. Because there's rubber, a lot of rubber in cars, and a lot of plastic in cars. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click this button, and I'm going to send it to, uh, to the Neo database. Let the query run. And we're also building the UI model as well. So there, there go my commodities, and now I have now I'm creating a series of visualizations on top of that. So over here I can see uh, this bar chart, and I can see that Michigan is exporting, uh, you know, 74,000. Um, that's that's in uh, values. So it's importing and what it's exporting, and then how how each area. So basically, it gets aggregated into a state, and then there's also the sub area. So I can click off whether I want to import it or whether I want to export it. Okay. So now, what the next thing is, I also want to see geographic information associated with that. So I can. Uh, we also have what we have our Google Maps integration, 
which allows you to put the information on the Google Map. Uh, so we're actually rendering right on top of uh, so different areas of, of, of Google, Google Maps. So I can zoom down on certain areas and see what areas I'm interested in. So now I can see that the state of Kentucky, what areas of Kentucky are, are, are there. And uh, you can see how the tree controls, which are completely data driven, are controlling the Google Map with, the, with no code. So without any code, we basically built a web application that can integrate with the graph database uh, that you can download in basically, as Ryan said, almost a minute and run that CSV script and populate it with data. We got this data from data.gov. So, I mean, we went up and just looked for the sample data sets and we pulled it up and we basically created it. They, they gave it to us as CSV files and we just created the script to populate Neo. And then within a few hours, we had this web application running. Um, so basically there's a series of areas that I could turn off uh, different areas so I'm integrating into what's going on in Austin, Texas. And I can see how commodities are moving across the state. So uh, what Tom Sawyer does is allows you to do uh, graphical layouts and uh, graphical controls and graphical displays of, of, of the information as well. So we have uh, what we call our hierarchical layout, which allows you to do like what we call forest direct. Uh, hierarchical layout, which uses the order of information and the how the linked link topologies are connected. Um, so I can see, I can also have a series of controls, so I have a, re a series of sliders. So say I only want to see products that are only or upwards of a, over half a billion dollars. So if I don't know, type in say 500. So I only want to see stuff that has uh, upwards of 500 billion. I mean, 500 million. Sorry, it's hard to hold the microphone. So you can see how the the, the controls are man manipulating the data that is displayed in the drawing. Okay. So I have a series of layouts. I can see that I, I can mouse over each one of these tools, and I can see uh, of the edges and see that what, how the commodities are flowing between the different regions. Um, so I can, I can reset the, the filter, and I can click what we call uh, our orthogonal layout. And what's kind of cool is that I can group, like I can group this information what we, into what we call our nesting, or our, what we call complexity management, which allows us to hide and show information at different levels. So I, I want to group these by state, and so what I'm doing is aggregating them together, and so I can drill into each state and see what's going on into that. So I can flash that everything. So now I, what I've done is I've created an abstraction layer, and now I can see how commodities are flowing within that, and I can drill straight into the state of Texas and see how that's looking. Um, you can control different settings from here. You can search within the model too as well, so I can type in Texas and, then, uh, and it would allow me to uh, navigate around the drawing. So I can like, this is all web based and it's HTML5 with the uh, animational effects. We have different layout styles and different, uh, different drawing styles. Uh, we have a little overview control which allows you to zoom around the diagram. And we also, so it's fully integrated with, so if I click in one area, it will actually move it in the other control as well. So if, uh, if I click on it in the diagram, it will bring it to me in Google Maps. It will also um, do other things like that. Um, so the thing about the Perspectives Designer is that it's rule-based, which, so given that, right, so we have a series of views for instance, the, the drawing view, I, if I wanted to modify the toolbars and the context menus, it's all completely data driven. So it's very easy to add and remove functionality from the web application. Um, and the, the power of, of, of perspectives is that you can integrate it from multiple sources. So you could have information that's in, part of your information that's in a relational database, and then have your, your linked data, which is like, because a lot of people have existing apps that they got to keep moving. 
Either they're going to do a full migration to a graph database, or they just want to do the new part that's really graph database intensive into like a Neo4j or another type of structure. And then eventually they, they'll do a full migration, but they only want to run some some parts of their database that like they can't do alters on or stuff like that that has more dynamic uh, property attributes. Um, so we have charts, views, trees. Uh, we also have these other types of filters and other kinds of things like that. So the, the main thing is is that you you extract this, you build a UI schema which matches the database, and then you define a series of rules which allow you to populate that. So if I look at the drawing view, how does that work? So I go in here and I say, okay, I have a definition. When I hit an area, I have a series of rules that will act, will, will execute. And this is all rule driven, and so it allows me to basically add nodes. But we also have the ability to control like what the shapes look like, what the properties are, um, and other things like that. Um, so the power of Tom Sawyer basically allows you to basically build uh, dynamic applications rapidly against databases and quickly deploy them to the web. Um, and we also we support image map mode, which is like no client, which is like you have older web browsers that you need to support for uh, a lot of times like government agencies have like older browsers that they have to require to support or um, we support image map, which is ultra thin client. We support HTML5, and it's a full uh, JTEE app server framework, so you can code on the server side as well. Um, we in this demo we don't do a lot of analytics, but we have a full blown analytics on top of the um, on top of the uh, graph model that's generated into the UI. So you can do uh, like um, you know like the six degrees of Kevin Bacon game kind of stuff like that shortest paths and uh, different types of graph analytics where they'd be like clustering like so okay uh, my graph got generated now I need to understand like where are, are there patterns in that graph like get me the groups within that graph um, and then allow me to do actions on top of those groups and so in this case we were just showing that we were taking states and we were grouping them by state so if I go back to Firefox um, you know, everything is undoable as well. So. And we have like this hierarchy which allows me to... Um, so if I wanted this to look that way, but I also now I can say I want, it, I want it to look like I want curved edges, or I want to look at it top to bottom, I can do that. And so if I lay it out, I'm just going to flip it around and bring it this way top down. Or I could say I want uh, rounded edges like orthogonally, and I want it to lay it out. It'll, it'll flip them around and I'll point them down. So we have we have support the notion of edge labels and um, you know edges can be controlled dynamically and tooltips are all generated dynamically from the data. Um, so basically that's the quickest briefest overview of perspectives. It's uh, um, you know the, the 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 thing is like data is all migrating towards like graph databases. And uh, a lot of information is moving towards this model with, with the loosely defined schemas, uh, with, the, with web services really growing in popularity, you're starting to see a lot more um, property, property graph based models that allow you to uh, have dynamic attribute sets that can, where the system becomes more agile. I mean, you're not so tied down. Okay. So getting back to my, uh, I'll just go over this really quick. So I just went over bar charts, the map view, the hierarchical layout drawing, uh, or the table view I'll actually show you. Um, the table view is kind of cool. Uh, if I go over here, and go into here. So like you can have custom, like the table view is so very easy to generate that like it just points at the model and that thing comes up as a tab. I can show you a quick example real quick. So if I go up here, and since I can switch to another editor. So I can run it in the desktop if I want. So this whole app right here was completely generated from, uh, it's a swing app in this case, but in another case we did the same thing as a web app. And then the tables are fully integrated with the drawing model as well. 
Um, but the, the thing is, we support uh, Cypher. So what we've shown is that you could take Cypher queries, connect them to your Neo data, and then bring them up into a web application very quickly. Uh, with a little bit of time and thought, you can really put together some very, really powerful applications. Um, that, uh, when you put the, the, the storage capability of, of the billions in the Neo side, but you, could, you don't really want to show a hairball or billions to your user. There's different techniques to reducing that set down to something that's manageable by the user and then give them like, the tools that they need to filter through that information to get the, the nuggets. Basically what you want to do is get to the nuggets of what's really important within that uh, connected information structure. Okay, so... Um, Questions or comments? Anybody have any questions? <laughs>